Mic check, mic check, one, two, there we go. 
That took me a little longer than expected, but um, that camera is way too low. But hello everyone and uh, welcome again to this Sunday's live stream. I'm going to just kind of fix this camera while I do the intro. Um, yeah, so you might have looked at the title and, and went like, what? 3D faxing? Scanning? All in one? Is that like a, a thing now? Do, do, we, do we now have like, you know, the, the, that trend from the desktop 2D inkjet printers? Pretty much, pretty much. So, um, as always, I am, I am woefully underprepared. Um, I guess that's sort of a, the trademark thing. Um, yeah, but I think whatever we do today, it's going to be worth it. So this is the AIO Robotics Zeus. Um, it's, you know, it's the world's smartest all-in-one 3D printer. Um, that's what it promises. I think it's also pretty much the world's only all-in-one 3D printer. Um, there, I, I think the, the Da Vinci ones do something like that. But for the most part, this is like the pretty much the flagship of, of all-in-one, you know, scanner, printer. And as far as I know, it's also got a fax functionality. We, I don't think we're going to be able to, to try that out. But um, yeah, right. Um, knife here. So like I said, I, I didn't prepare anything. Um, AI, robot, AI Robotics claim that you can set this thing up in 10 minutes and get printing and scanning uh, to do that. So I actually brought a few models. I got some sort of vase. I got this little angel, uh, which I actually already scanned and uh, copied before. Um, this one was scanned on like a, a spin scan, laser scan type of thing. It's, it's not quite as big, you know, the, the proportions are off. And I think this is going to be like the first thing we're going to try out to scan and replicate with this thing. Um, supposedly you can also use it completely without any sort of a uh, USB desktop uh, interface software. It's got a touchscreen and stuff in there. So yeah, uh, it's called Zeus, so it must be big. Actually it's, uh, it's a relatively compact box. I mean. I've, I've had uh, the Mark II shipped in a bigger crate than this. So, um, unfortunately to do it today, I don't think I have an overhead camera, but there's not going to be too much unboxing to do. Uh, can I set up one up? No. So, let's just cut in here and um, show you guys the stuff as we can, uh, as we grab it out of the box. So, like I said, never tried this one before. Um, haven't actually opened the box and I do have to ship this one back, unfortunately. So yeah, first off power supply, standard brick thing. What is this? 24 volt, five amp, uh, US power cord. I'm going to substitute my own European one for that. There is a Schnellstadt on that thing. Oh, so they've actually printed out a German version of a, uh, of a quick start guide. Right there. Wow, that camera has a lot of lag today. So actually a bunch of pictures. Um, yeah, like I said, this, this machine is going to go out to another reviewer after me, I think. So I do sort of have to be careful. And I think that's why they included the, the German guide there. Okay, I can already see the machine in here. There's two more boxes that I sort of don't want to leave flopping around. Spatula, glue stick, a USB. Is that a Wi-Fi dongle? That looks like it might actually be a Wi-Fi dongle. Um, okay, let's take that out. So, glue stick. That's a ferrite bead that you... I don't know where you want to add that. We'll, we'll see in the quick start guide. And this looks like it's, it's a tiny, tiny Wi-Fi dongle. Interesting. We're going to have to try that out. Then some sort of spool holder. I, what? Oh, what? Ah, okay. So this is um, a white powder thing. So this looks like it's a, it's a blower. I have no idea how this works, but um, if you're familiar with 3D scanning, um, essentially anything that's reflective, like this vase, which has a glossy paint on it, um, this is not going to scan well because the laser is just going to bounce off it and, you know, land somewhere else. So, um, 
if you have glossy surfaces like that, you put this uh, talcum powder on it and it, you know, essentially turns a glossy surface into a matte one. Very, very cool. And a spinny platform. Okay, so there's a calibration pattern included in there. Do I have to stick this on? We're going to see. Um, this is a, a glass surface. I guess this doubles as a build plate. It's got these three registration pins down here and yeah, easy to take out, I suppose. And we've got the, the pattern on here, um, I suppose, to lay it on um, during or before scanning. Right, next up, half a second of difference. Yeah, that's like, doesn't matter too much. Um, you're not seeing my mouth, so the, the talking audio voice thing isn't gonna be that much offset, so that's okay. Uh, a sample spool of filament, so this is a sapphire blue 1.75 millimeter PLA. Okay, it says in, in bold letters there. Um, if you actually look at the, the AIO website, their filament is actually very reasonably priced, which I did not expect. Uh, the spool is $12.99 plus tax and stuff. So that's 500 grams. That is a reasonable like $26 before tax. Uh, oh, we're gonna need that. Before, uh, yeah, I was gonna say $26 per tax. Come on, how to, how to language. $26 before tax per kilogram of PLA. That is, that is very decent actually. Now, for the big boy. For the big boy. So dusting pen, spatula, Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. It doesn't really say on there. It, it has an whoops, it has an FCC ID. And that's about it. Let's see if the quick start guide says anything about taking it out of the box. I've had that before where someone was like, oh you, you grabbed it wrong. Nope. Let's see. So no obvious handles, but there's something loose in there. There we go. Okay, that's it. That's all that's in the box. You can see there's only one piece of packaging foam in there. So that is all you get. Um, by the way, if you if you want to buy one of these, um, all the wow, that auto exposure is not holding up. Um, if you want to buy one of these, the purchasing links are in the description to the AIO guys, to to Amazon and all that stuff. Um, it's twenty four ninety nine, which I think is, is actually also pretty reasonable. Uh, one second, I actually gotta click this camera down. There you go. That should be a bit better. Uh, this is $24.99, so it's... That's the price of an Ultimaker 2, which does not scan. <laughs> I mean, I, I, if, it, if it works as well as advertised, that is pretty much a, 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 yeah, an unbeatable deal. So on the, on the side here, so this is, this is obviously the front of the machine. On the side here we have a handle, a, you know, sheet metal door. Lift with your knees, yeah, right. Ooh, that looks industrial. We're gonna take a better peek inside that in a second. So there's a 3D printed spool holder. I like those little details. We can see, you know, these guys are actually using 3D printers and not just selling them as a gimmick. 3D printed spool holder, so that's where your filament goes. A little Bowden or, well, reverse Bowden tube. A switch that detects whether the door is open. That's cool, let's close that back up and keep the tape. Like I said, I do have to ship this thing somewhere else when I'm done with it. Uh, let's get this one off of the foam. <laughs> Looks like a microwave. It sort of does. It sort of looks like a, well, not like a kitchen appliance, but like a, a miniature CNC mill sort of thing. You know, the Psycho Mori sort of uh, machines, they, they look pretty similar to this. Um, they've got the, the same sort of control panel on the side and then your, your working envelope over here. So it's, you know, it definitely feels like a, a very sturdy machine. So this is all sheet metal, this is all steel. Um, of course, when you bang on it, you, you hear, you know, stuff banging against it. Um, there's a few vents on this side, so this is sort of perforated. There are a, woo, there are a few vents on the other side as well, but no door. 
but the handle on the bottom here, so theoretically, yeah, that's the way you should lift it up. And let's see how we can open this one. So there's another piece of tape. Now, unboxings are always sort of awkward when you when you have the camera facing one way and you're trying to do stuff from the other side, and it's like, mm. Oop, that that doesn't feel like it wants to. Oh, okay. So it's not just like a container style lid. It's actually got like a what is this called? Like a, a double bar hinge where it floats up like that. That is cool. It's it's a bit wobbly, but nothing that should impair functionality, but it, it looks cool again. So this is a, a semi-translucent black acrylic, um, which essentially, you know, gives you sort of a view inside the build space. I, you know, I, I always like to look at my stuff, but you know, a lot of manufacturing manufacturers, including like Zortrex are saying, hey, uh, you know, if you want to peek in there, go ahead, but you, you don't need to stare inside the machine all the time because like it's, it should be pretty reliable. Okay, next spool of filament, a red PLA. Um, I don't know if they're always including two, but in this case they did. There's another one of those uh, switches that detects whether the uh, this door is closed or not. More foam. Good thing I've got a recording of this. Uh, it's gonna be pretty hard to put it together totally properly. Does it also do convection cooking? <laughs> I don't know. Um, so it is a it is a relatively well closed build envelope. Like I said, it's got the vents on the side, which you can sort of see poking through here. Um, but it's um, it's not part, it, it's not strictly a fully closed off and sealed build envelope. So um, like for something like ABS, I think you'd be better off than just with a completely open machine. But then again, it's not like actively heated or sealed or, or anything. So I, I'd say like five to 10 degrees above ambient if you really want to do it. If this thing even has a heated bed, I don't think it does. Well, I'm gonna have to, I'm just gonna have to try it out. Class one lasers in there. Yes, the tinted um, window. That's a, a good explanation for that because it is a laser scanner, which I think lives over here. Just gonna give you guys a, a good view in a second after we get all this packaging material out. There we go. Yeah, so class one lasers, you know, I, I, I think the, you know, if I'm not mistaken here, the, the class one is like the lowest, what is this? Uh, the lowest rating of, of laser basically saying, yeah, your, your reflexes of your eyelids are gonna protect you from any harm from those. Um, now that's, that's another class, but basically class one is like not dangerous to your eyes. That's a waste for no heated bed. Turn it towards the camera. Yes, like I said, we're gonna give you guys a good look around because this thing looks very... Well, it, it doesn't look like a, like a typical 3D printer. Let's see what we have here. So this is a print head. I, I already saw a, um, a nozzle poking through there. There we go, so that's an extra yeah so that's a that's like a sort of a quick release right there that's a an extra tool head so sort of traditional all metal hardened but with a um with a pcb on the back here which looks like a pt100 amplifier or something um yeah maybe maybe a mosfet for the nope that's a pt100 amplifier or a thermocouple amplifier and then the contact point so this is like a quick change uh, tool head basically you, you take the, the old one out put a new one in and uh, don't have to connect anything up or, or calibrate anything I'd suppose and again this this does not look like your typical um, you know 3d printed or sheet metal bent stuff that, that you get elsewhere this looks like a proper uh, mass-produced uh, machine right there so 
Yeah, we're not going to need this one for now. So let's keep this one in its little uh, ESD baggie. And let's see which camera are we on? Both. Great. So there's the tape for the X axis. Oh, that's wow, that's going in there pretty far. So I guess we should have removed this one from the from the hatch on the left side, which gives you access to the spool holder. And what else? I think there's like one more thing that we have to take care of. Yeah, right. Let's scoot this guy over. And not lose these parts. This is sort of in frame, right? Ah, yeah. Sweet. That's a fresh touchscreen. This looks like a 7-inch uh, screen right there, which is pretty large for a 3D printer. But before we get into that, let's give you guys a walk around the machine. And I think we're better off on the on the wide angle lens over there. So there's your machine. Um, seven inch touchscreen on the front, power button, um, two USB jacks right there. There's of course your um, your build volume door. Um, relatively classic setup. So you've got the Y axis uh, moving the printhead back and forth. You've got the X axis moving left and right. There's some sort of, of metal bushings in here. Um, I'm actually going to move around here. Metal bushings in here, um, also on the Y-axis. The Z-axis is your, your traditional or your sort of Ultimaker style gantry with the spindle in the center. You should be able to see that, yeah. And some Aegis bushings on these 10 millimeter rods. Um, yeah, so the 3D printer part right there is relatively traditional. However, detail right there, this is an encoder wheel. That's the first time I'm seeing that. There's something in the, oh, there's some gunk left over in the um, fill-in path there. That would have <laughs> not ended well. Anyways, encoder, so that's a filament run-out sensor and actually a filament grind-through sensor more or less. So if your filament stops feeding, this wheel is gonna stop turning and it's gonna alert something supposedly and, you know, stop the, stop the print for you. Um, relatively, Standard direct drive extruder on top there and then of course down here. Let's just take this one out real quick While it's still fresh and new so it's just these two tabs on the side and the entire thing pops out that is pretty well done if it can uh, Register the tool head reliably into the same uh, position Sweet um, Now on the inside of the machine <laughs> this table is in the way. And this camera, that camera is now completely off where I wanted it. Anyway, so on the inside of the machine, let's tilt this guy up here. So you can see that there's a lot of sheet metal going on. So a lot of the, the standard um, uncoated sheet metal steel, um, which is, you know, something you typically find in a 2D inkjet printer. So, you know, the, the insides here look very, very similar to, to what you'd see on your... Uh, Epson Brother, HP, uh, you name it, uh, 2D printers, injection molded parts over here. So very professionally designed, I'd say. Oh, this thing, I missed one. I missed one right here. That didn't come off cleanly. But yeah, that's that, that's the, the switch. Let's walk around a bit further. So again, the, what is this? The right side of the machine, I guess. Um, nothing but a vent. The rear of the machine also very plain and empty, but there is um, an ethernet jack right there, a USB slave port. Basically that's where you'd plug it into your computer, an on off switch and a, what is that? That is a four pin DIN port. I guess that's some sort of a, oh, okay, power supply. 
obviously. And then the left side of the machine, I never know which side is like left and right with these. So left side of the machine, got your door right there um, into which you load your filament. Let's actually pop one of these open. Ah, Medi Golden Tall, thanks for um, posting those uh, those specs right there. Print resolution 80 micron, 120 micron, 200 micron. Yeah, so that's like the typical breakdown you're getting. But I mean, ooh, that's very brittle filament. But typically, like you, you have um, your your quality settings, and you're mostly going to use like 200 micron or 150 micron, something like that. So let's just feed this one in here temporarily. Um, we're gonna go by the setup guide in a second anyway. So that's where your filament goes. That's sitting right in there and it actually clicks or you know, slots into these slots on the on the spool holder and gets held in place pretty nicely. Kensington, oh yeah. <laughs> Thanks for pointing it out. Sir Arston Earl of Karim, uh, there's also a Kensington lock port on the back here to, you know, which you can use to chain this machine down to whichever table or surface you have. That's, that's pretty cool. Uh, right. Right. Um, I guess let's just plug this thing in and see what happens. Um, I'm going to steal a power cord from Mark II. Right there, so that's a APD, Asian Power Devices Inc. power supply. Let's hope this one just keeps, <laughs> this one works out for me. So, there. So, like right now, what, what I want to try is, you know, see how much this machine can do on its own. Try to scan and replicate this little angel right here. Um, see how close it comes to what I did like a year ago. Um, see how well the, the output from this machine matches up. If it can, you know, if it can do that on its own, that's something I really want to see because that would be pretty epic, you know, scanning and copying without having to put it through some sort of CAD tool and, you know, m messing with the model. That's always the thing that holds me back from scanning. Um, so that's that's what I want to try out first and then maybe see how much um, we can do with the software while that thing is printing because that's going to take a a bit um, probably like an hour or so um, until this thing is printed and in that time I'm just going to try and get the software going so power switch is off so first sort of dislike right there this plug is not locking so it's just a a slide in slide out so if you um, if you accidentally pull on this this plug is going to come out very easily um, just something you have to keep, keep in mind maybe you know zip tie to the frame somewhere so um, you don't accidentally trip over it and uh, you know ruin your print let's turn it on yeah um, I guess we do have to we do have to push the power switch um, which is that's go. Is that going? That's going. Okay. And while that is booting up, yeah, 230 volts in Germany. Um, this is a, a switching power supply. It's 240 to 100 volts or 100 to 240 volts. Um, so it's a worldwide universal one. Hey, IO Robotics. That's the ZX and Fabric Coupler. See for your, see for yourself. Um, Nope, that's a stepper motor directly with, um, ooh, lights, fancy. That's a, a stepper motor directly with the lead screw integrated. Um, yeah, so Tür nach oben öffnen. We did that, remove packing material, did that platform, insert platform into Zeus. Okay, so that's something we should have done before plugging it in. Let's just do that right now. There are so many wires here. It is crazy. So right there. And if I can get over to the 
hot keys. Sorry if that's sort of loud for you guys. There we go. So there's our build plate. And that just that just pops in there like that. Oh, so it's it's magnetic. That's interesting. Okay, so this thing spins. Um, I can sort of turn it by head, but I don't want to force it too much. Um, this thing spins, so that's the spinning functionality for scanning and for regular 3D printing. It just you know moves the tool head in X, Y, and, and uh, in X and Y, and then moves the bed up and down in Z. That is, that's quite smart actually, because it, it doesn't require that many extra components. Okay, did that. Um, Insert platform into Zeus, did that, connect power brick, hold power button, did that, fill material, so fill material, push fill material into the uh, reverse Bowden tube, let's do that right now. So we already partially inserted it, um, it sounds like over here, is that in focus? Is that in focus? Yeah, sort of. So essentially there is your, your little Bowden tubelet. Uh, if you can see that and all we need to do supposedly is push this guy in there let's see so what I'm thinking is it's got a switch in there a, a filament sensor somewhere in the path that's a lot of filament that I'm pushing in um, where it will detect that hey okay now you've you've you're trying to feed filament and it's gonna grab it for us that's sort of the si That's not right. That's sort of the same approach that the um, cell Robox did. Let's see where this is go. Wow. Okay. Uh, guys. Is, there, is this supposed to be... Okay, that's <laughs> and here it begins now what I can show you on this camera here it begins um, so today we don't have a, um, a representative from AIO robotics in chat or present anywhere so basically I'm free to do whatever I want haha <laughs> not not quite um, but we don't have anyone that, that we can come back to and uh, ask or harass for discount codes. I know you guys like to do that. So what's happening here is I pushed the filament into the into the Bowden tube on the left side, which you can sort of see on the little corner. Well, we just saw it. It's a reverse Bowden tube essentially. And all it does is it comes out right here, um, which is just an open Bowden tube. So I don't know if I'm supposed to just feed this into the extruder next or something. Well, I, I can, but that's not going to do anything. Let's see if the if the quick start guide has any other tips right there. Um, spool turns clockwise. Hmm. Break a divide. Um, I didn't. I I did buy this. Um, so this one, as always, got sent to me um, as a review unit. Um, in this case, I do have to return it. Let's see, is there anything else in here? So there's, ah, so that's the extended quick start guide. Let me see, I might have pushed this out of position, but... I don't know guys. This might actually be a shipping defect um, where it got bounced around or something. But there are also no other parts in here that um, would indicate what this thing does. Read the fine manual, manual or use a hammer. Actually, let's, let's read the manual. There is no paper manual included as far as I can tell. So I'm gonna try and find a manual. Oh, 
Use a hammer. Um, is that one of those dodgy cloth peg springs up top? Being used to tension a belt. Um, can I see one of those? I can't well from this angle, I can't. Zeus. Um, so there's the wrong screen. Awesome. Uh, great. So I Let's switch you guys over quickly back to this one so I can configure the, uh, the screen cap. There we go. So there is the, there is the website. Let's see, support. Support. There we go. Just feed that filament in. Um, Ah, okay, so if we actually look at these, so just, just to give you guys a, a, uh, a quick overview of what you find uh, online support-wise, um, you get a few videos, you get a manual, you get email support. Um, I mean, if you buy this thing for two and a half thousand dollars, you can expect to get some sort of, you know, direct support. Um, how to, where to go from here, quick start video. So obviously this is like a, a wiki style, um, a wiki style, you know, online reference manual sort of thing. And yeah, that's that's the same guide I have with a German text overlay right here. Um, but essentially um, what it wants me to do is just feed this thing through. It doesn't say that it extends loosely into the build space right there. But from this point, it does look like all we have to do is like, you know, uh, power up the machine, tell it to load, and um, you know, load it in just like that. Right. Let's do that then, because that sounds like a sort of decent plan. Hey. So there's your extruder. There's the filament, and that just goes in right there. Boom. I can't really push it through the uh, through the hopped gear, but. We're gonna figure that out in a second, which you know, I, I guess there is some sort of a of a load cycle uh, included. Now this screen right here, um, if you guys have a look at that, should be some something visible. So this looks like a, a Linux desktop more or less. So you got your your keyboard, US locale uh, right there, Ethernet indicator, power button right there, sound actually. Then a few um, shortcuts right there, an LX terminal shortcut. Let's, let's see what that does. I know it, it, that's not what I'm supposed to do, but I just want to see if we can actually get a, a, a full uh, bash terminal running. Apparently not. So Zeus UI, that's what they want me to press. And actually, I, I don't think I'm supposed to see this screen right here. Um, in the first place because it loading Zeus here. There we go. So now it's it's loading something. Um, I guess it should be booting into the colorful UI um, right from the start. I think we, we had sort of that logo before. No, okay, so there we go. I don't know why it didn't start into this in the first place, but was, was I in, in, in the frame? Sorry. Um, it should be starting into this screen right there in the first place, I guess. So, yep. here we go. So hit control. So I guess that's like the, that, that looks like the guide. Hit park, uh, park. Okay. Uh, feed, yeah, feed all the way into the extruder. I did that. So what they want me to do right now is um, essentially apply some glue stick to the glass plate because this is non-heated, obviously. 
So let's do that. What would happen if you would plug a USB killer into it? Well, USB killers seem to be all the rage these days, but they're not something new and they've always been killing uh, USB devices for you know, quite a while. It's just an inherent thing of how USB ports are protected and it would kill this device very easily, very probably. Just as most other devices. So there's your layer of glue stick in the center right there. Such a small build volume. Yeah, someone posted the specs a second ago. There is, there's that. See how that was, I was in the way probably. Sorry, but this thing snaps into place pretty well. So, I mean, it's in a relatively uncomfortable position right now because it's like all the way down, but essentially you just plop it in there and it sort of, you know, auto aligns itself. Um, so essentially what they want me to do is hit print, hit database, print a sample part, which, uh, let's see if we can just get a, a sample part out. So, printer, yeah, I guess that's the lights. So it does have a few LED spots in there. Um, <laughs> that's in the home screen, print. Okay, so these are actually G-code previews. We're getting a, we can rotate this. Ooh, that's sketchy. Um, 20 millimeter box, guide filament. Um, let's print the AIO keychain. So these are already, is this a multi-touch? Nope. Um, but we get the zoom icons right there. So this looks like a, mm. ah. AO keychain, that should be a very quick print, 6 minutes 29. Um, since it doesn't have a heated bed, it print or it, it should heat up pretty quickly. Um, now right here it tells us, where was it? Uh, there we go. Mit Tür offen drucken ist besser. So essentially printing with the door open is better for print quality since I guess stuff doesn't heat up. Um, Whatever, seems, seems sort of counterintuitive to put a, a nice door like that on a machine and then tailor to leave it open while you're printing. But let's just try that and see what it does. Start printing, okay. It's gonna be, in ooh, that's a nice loop right there. It's gonna be interesting to see if this, um, wow, that didn't sound nice. This actually feeds the filament properly. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm inclined to give it a, a quick push. But, so it did something cool right there. It popped down a Z-axis sensor. Or a, uh, an auto-leveling sensor, which probably is already gone by now. Uh, camera, focus, please. Don't leave me alone. Why camera, why? Okay. Um, you really can't see it, to be honest. Um, so back here somewhere, there was a switch that popped on. I guess it's in this slot. I don't think you guys can see it that much, but um, essentially there is a switch that pops down and um, measures the uh measures the, the bed does does an auto z leveling pass more or less okay i love these cameras for like you know recording stuff but when it comes to actually uh, when, when when it comes to actually trying to focus <laughs> while it's you know outputting a video stream it's they're pretty horrible right so right now what does the screen so say so the screen says we're at one, so I guess it's set to 197 degrees and it's around 200. Um, that's pretty good. That's pretty fast heat up. Clanking is just parts wearing in. I think the clanking is actually, you know, the, the probe dropping down. Um, let me just see if this is actually pulling it in. It is not. Now it is. Ah, okay, so there, there's a lever right there that, le that lets us um, detension the, uh, what's it called? The idler lever, essentially. Mm -hmm. 
So the I suppose the the quick focus pass, quick camera swap. So I suppose the the encoder wheel up here um, must have detected that it didn't feed filament the first few seconds or so until I pushed it in. Um, however, it didn't really do anything, and now we're left with a sort of spotty um, first layer right there. And apparently this machine was tested with orange filament um, and only now we're getting the, the blue filament to come out. But so far it seems to be working relatively well. Um, I mean it's not the quietest machine ever as expected since it's like a very, a very rigid frame and stuff. Um, guys complaining about the depth of field. We should be able to fix that. Maybe. Maybe not. There we go. Oh, now we're just getting noise. Compromise. Right there. You know what, let's actually swap lenses because like depth of field doesn't matter. And a zoom lens is much more useful. Yay! I feel like I'm always switching to, to zoom lens midway um, into the stream because like I'm, I'm like screw aesthetics. Uh, what's it sound like with the door closed? Good question. So right now it's, you know, I, I, I can actually pull out the decibel meter and give you guys a live reading. So you always want to take your measurement from one meter away. And this thing is exactly a meter. So we've got a, what are these called? Passavalge, that's, that's the word I know for them. And there's one meter and what's it saying? So that's 50 to 54 decibels. Let's close the door. Okay, so it's a bit quieter. It's, it's you know, I, I, I am hearing a bit of stepper wine, but that's okay. So pretty much identical, of course, it's, it's now printing a different part of the G-code, um, so it's not really comparable, but the door, you know, the door sort of dampens out um, the um, like fan noises and, and all the high pitch stuff and, and makes it a bit more bearable. Spirit level, yeah, that's the word. Thanks, guys. About the pass in touch, yeah. Okay, so that's working. Pretty much, I think it's it's actually sticking relatively well. Yeah, and I mean, print speed is pretty fast. Do we have actually some sort of reading right there? Nah, we're not getting a, a millimeter per second reading uh, on the screen, but it's like decently fast and accelerations and stuff are fairly high as well. Of course, I'm gonna test this one for resonances because that's always a problem with these uh, higher acceleration and higher speed machines. And it is a direct drive or a non-Bowden extruder. So you've got the extruder motor right there. You've got the, the gear right there. So it's direct drive non-Bowden. Um, there is a part cooling fan right here, so the same sort of um, radio blower style that the, the Prusa i3 Mark II uses and then the outlet right there. Uh, that's the inlet for the hot and cooling with fancy LED in there. And yeah, no rotation for printing. Yeah, so the, the plate, if we actually grab the camera and have a look underneath. Wow, can I actually grab this one? I don't know. 
Oh yeah. Let's leave it on the tripod. So for printing, um, this build plate pretty much just moves on the Z-axis. You can see the Eagles bushings um, on the back right there. So there's one, there's two. These are locked into these bushing or bearing blocks, which aren't really intended for Eagles bushings, but for cantilever axes like this, it should work. Um, and then we have this gearing setup right there. So there's your, your big, um, your big gear and there's a small little stepper motor on the back right there and the wire f from an encoder so these are these are encoder teeth up here there's an optical um what is it called optical sensor more or less uh, the wire going down here and there is your tiny tiny stepper motor for the uh, for the rotational axis of this entire print bed and some can you see these these are like laser centered um, nylon pegs that the glass surface rides on we're gonna try that out in a second So let's have a look while it is printing. Let's have a look at the UI. Um, can the base rotate in base mode? I don't think um, the base ever rotates for 3D printing. I think it's all really only there for, um, for the 3D scanning part of this machine. Right, while that's printing, let's see what we can do with the, uh, with the interface. So obviously there is some sort of a Linux-based machine running this touchscreen. And I think it shouldn't mess too much with the print uh, if we do stuff while, uh, while it's working. So let's head back to home. Yeah. And the print's done. That's good. So we've got a My Mini Factory search. Wow, oh, that, uh, that doesn't sound healthy. We've got a My Mini Factory search, we've got Thingiverse. Obviously this machine is not connected to a network at the moment. I'm just scanning around to see if we find a long Ethernet cord. Um, let's see, so typically you know you you'd see the, um, the search results from those sites pop up there. Um, let's see if we can actually connect it to Wi-Fi and, and get that stuff working. Wi-Fi now connected. Okay, so that's the... Yeah, okay. Um, quick start guide part two. Is that... Oh, that second camera is in the way. I'm sorry about that. Um, quick start guide part two. Connect the Wi-Fi dongle. So this thing is actually a Wi-Fi dongle that we have to plug in first. Again, this is a, um, a Linux-based machine. And I'm guessing you could just plug in your USB thumb drive and use it like that. That shouldn't be much of an issue. But before we do that, let's have a look at the part we printed. So again, there goes the filament. Good thing they've included two spools. So again, the build plate just pops out really, really easily. Um, print quality, you know, first side looks pretty okay. A, a bit of over extrusion going on, but we're gonna see if, if we can dial that in. So the spatula very dull on the front. I'm actually gonna switch over to the, where did I put it? Um, to the tool that was included with the uh, Atom 3D printer, which is a sharp, they call, it a, they call it a leather knife, but I don't think this is an actual knife. It looks like a, a chisel sort of, and this one is sharp actually. Should we sharpen this one? And with this one, parts just pop off like that. So, there we go, there's our first print. I should switch cameras first. So we drop this one back in. And there we go, there's our print. How to camera? Nope. There we go. So that's the first print. And I mean, looks decent, looks okay. Looks like it's a, 
you know, no, no obvious flaws except for, like I said, this, this bit of over extrusion, but very decent print for, you know, a, a right out of the box and, and literally zero calibration and tuning in. Um, and mostly, I guess you could do this, um, you could do this uh, within 10 minutes if you wanted to. Of course, that's not your own print, that is just the sample print, but yeah, pretty good, pretty good. Okay, um, Wi-Fi not connected, let's continue with that. So. Let's switch cameras. I sort of need a, a wireless keyboard too, um, I think. Wi-Fi settings. So, essentially what they're telling me to do is to either plug in an Ethernet wire. I do have a bunch of Ethernet stuff right there, but I don't think I have one that's long enough. So we're just gonna plug in the Wi-Fi stick. It's got a little LED in there. That's, I think, just the, the standard um, chipset that, that everyone's using for, for Raspberry Pis and stuff. Let's see if that actually picks it up or if we do have to like refresh the page. There we go. Okay, um, I'm gonna block the screen for a second because I do need to type in my password. This one's going over there and that one's going, well, gonna see my back. I'm hoping this one doesn't just spew out my, my password in a second. So connecting. Let's see, I know Wi-Fi reception is... Whoa, connected. Okay, I know Wi-Fi reception is not the greatest down here, but the Wi-Fi down seems to be handling it pretty well. So we've got the, we've got the Wi-Fi connected, but it looks like the Zeus UI crashed or something. Let's just start that back up. Um, this isn't something that I think should happen um, on a production machine. You guys trying to guess my password? You know, you're not gonna guess it. But you, you're welcome to, to submit your, um, you're welcome to submit your guesses. Right, so the, um, <laughs> Why is, why is the Wi-Fi called Fritz? Um, because we have like these all-in-one router modem things uh, called Fritzbox. They're, they're pretty awesome. They're German, well, Ch Chinese made probably, but they're, they're a German company and everyone has them here. So supposedly, oh, so, so that's an update? Yeah. So we could update this one, but I don't know how long that's gonna take. So I'm, no, I don't wanna do that. Um, so there we go. Um, I'm not gonna update that right now. I'm just gonna see if the search now works. 10 a.m. Sunday, November 6th. So 7, 10 p.m. So it picked up the network time, I guess. Um, still not really loading up anything. It's sort of blinking. That might just be the, the weak Wi-Fi down here. Okay, that's not doing anything. Right, um, that's gonna be something for further investigation. Manual, what? What, manual? Come on. Well, as I'm, as I'm reading the quick start guide, literally. Okay, so it doesn't have a doesn't have a part about the scanning on the uh, quick start guide. So we're just gonna see how well we can get that going um, without this thing. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping the, the interface right there gives us enough guidance so that we don't need to pull up any sort of additional guide. Let's see, so if we're saying scan, place object on center of turntable. I'm not gonna do that while it's moving. Ooh, you see that? So it's got a camera in there, as obviously laser scanners tend to do. Um, it's giving us the scan radius, sort of. 
um, that we can configure and with the right camera, there's my backside. So we can configure the scan radius, you know, as is typical for these sort of laser line um, sort of machines. We can make the radius smaller or larger. So you, oh, I can see the mouse cursor popping up. Um, so you eliminate any sort of artifacts outside of that radius. Um, if, for example, you know you're going to scan this thing, which is just a, a bit smaller. Let's just place that in here. And the camera obviously is on the left side of the machine. So there's that. I think that might actually be too tall. Wow. Calvet scanner. Ah, okay. Tips. Calibration should be done during the first setup of Zeus and whenever you want to change scan height. Covered in the next slide. Okay, so I guess we do need to change scan height. Um, use the approximate scan height prior to calibration and scanning to make sure the okay. How do we change that? Yeah, translucent. We do have a, a few challenging um, objects here. So can we do, I guess we have to go into settings. Scan and print calibrate scanner. Okay. I mean, that's, that's intuitive enough for me for calibration so I'm guessing it's telling us to put the calibration sheet inside the physical machine there we go however that is sort of curved that's not holding down flat well I guess I guess with the glue stick it, it sort of is oh well three inches that's a bit more than three inches Yeah, something is resonating there. I'm guessing it's it's like I probably shouldn't get my hand in there. Um, ooh, I'm guessing it's some part of the of the sheet metal construction, um, some sort of bracket that's just ah, I can still change it. So this is like yeah, four inches should be okay. I'm hoping that works. Wait for calibration to finish. Okay. I'm hoping you can change that while it's already starting. Let's just let that run. Doesn't look too user friendly. Well, it's, I think it's, it's doing a prel well, pretty, a relatively good job of, um, you know, staying user friendly because it's, it's, it's a bit more than your typical 3d printer gives you as far as you know functionality goes it's got a scanner in there it's got wi-fi it's got you know the the um, part libraries integrated um you know all that is is of course included in this little box and it's also a linux machine so um yeah i i would have guessed that the the software is actually a bit more complex than that interest though yeah <laughs> I mean, I can understand that this being a US machine, I, I actually have to get some sort of measuring tape. In the... I can understand that this machine is US based and that they, they would use inches, but I mean, 3D printing is like all about uh, millimeters. I, I haven't seen anyone use inches or thou or whatever crazy other furlong units you guys have. Um, I, I wouldn't really want to see inches in there, or at least a, a quick change option. We're going to see if, if the settings menu has an option to change that um, in a second. Where did I put my part? There it is. So this is 10 centimeters, pretty much exactly. It's a bit taller than 10 centimeters, so that's a bit over uh, four inches. Hmm. Let's just boop that up to 4.2, which is like 10 point, what, 508? Oh, no, a bit more than that. <sighs> yeah. That's that. I'm hoping it, it just, you know, does it uh, in real time. I don't, I don't want to recalibrate this entire thing. 
Yeah, you can use G-code with inches, but you, you, you shouldn't. You really shouldn't. <laughs> um, why put a switch there if the do door does not need to be closed? Um, I'm guessing once we start the scanning, once we turn on the laser, this thing is going to have to be closed and it's going to tell us to close it. If not, mm, I don't know. <laughs> we're we're going to have to figure out why that switch is even there. Yeah, so if, if anyone did the, um, did the conversion of the build volume from inches to millimeters yet, um, feel free to post it in, in chat. Um, that would be great. <laughs> you can hold the part at the screen, the blue block. The blue block, which blue block? Yeah, so we are... So for, for, for those of you asking, hey, did we scan already? Did we print already? Yes, we did already print the sample part that I placed, misplaced somewhere. So there is our sample part that is just a pre-sliced um, keychain thing that printed in six minutes or so. Pretty good quality, worked reliably, you know, plug and play confirmed, that works. Um, so right now we are preparing for scanning um, because I do sort of want to replicate this little uh, angel doodad sculpture, Chinese mass produced uh, thing. So yeah, and try, just try to see how um, how well that compares to the results I got with just another laser scanner. So. Uh, I don't know what's what's going on right there because the the <laughs> the pill plate is definitely not moving right now, but I'm seeing something rotating on screen. Is that just showing at us what it's processing right now? Starting laser. Oh, I wow. <laughs> did did you did you guys hear that? It's like a. That is, that is well. So, so we are getting the, the green keyed um, view on the, on the screen right there and the actual laser that's happening um, inside the machine there. So the, the laser isn't static either. The laser is actually panning left to right. That's a first. And we can actually get our, our eyes in there. So that's just a, a regular line laser. Give you guys a, a bit of a view of what's going on there. So there is the which just shut off right there. That's a little laser hole. Um, you could just barely not see it. Um, well, you can actually right there. That that little round part right there. That's the laser itself, and you can sort of see it turning um, to camera right right now and homing itself into that uh, into that optical switch. That's the LED panel. Okay. Saving calibrations. So I'm guessing, I'm guessing it uh, succeeded. Okay. Calibration successful. Okay. Turntable is not. Okay. So we can, we can adjust the scan height during calibration, but it's only going to calibrate for whatever we set when we started calibrating. So because we want to scan this thing, this is a bit over, over four inches, we have to calibrate again. Yay! Uh, come on. You ex designers, you can do better than that. Just want to scan something. Okay, scanning 228 millimeters diameter by 101.6. So that is pretty much this part right here is pretty much the maximum of what we can scan already. So that's not particularly tall. Um, I'm guessing like the, the build volume in there would suggest a bit more, but that's all you're gonna get. Um, so I'm guessing we can scan, I, I brought an Xbox 360 controller. I guess we can scan this one. Um, we should also be able to scan this vase if you put some talcum powder on there. <laughs> just knocked the head of the statue. Nope. We could also scan like, you know, stuff like these lenses, but as soon as you go beyond that, that height, for example, if you, well, 
I guess this Buddha would would fit in, you know, on the um, on the diameter side of things, but height, of course, um, it's going to get cut off somewhere around its waist. You need to change the height while it's calibrating. Well, you, I tried that, um, but obviously it calibrated only for the height um, that it started on. So if you change it right now, if you, whoops, did I do anything? No. So if you change it right now, if you change it to, to whatever height um, you want, we'd have to recalibrate it again, which we're doing right now. Can you show the Y-axis movement mechanics? Um, not right now, because right now it's calibrating, but well, I, I can show it in motion, but I can show you um, what the mechanics look like. Fortunately, I can't take the camera off the tripod because, you know, there, there's stuff um, and wires attached to that. So if, yeah, thanks for, come on, turn the light back on. So that's. I know that is super noisy, um, but you can sort of see there is just one, one 10 millimeter rail on each side. Um, there's the belt up there with the washer or um, with a clothes peg spring on it, which uh, I'd rather not see in a 3D printer. Um, yeah, but that's that. And obviously the same, th the same stuff on the other side. Um, that's just the injection molded bracket on the back there, which connects the y-axis to the x-axis and vice versa. Yeah. Yep, so that's that. And now it's still calibrating. It's saying 129 remaining. Audio origami, audio origami. Everyone hit the like button. I'd, I'd appreciate that. Um, Actually, so what, one thing I, I'm, I'm trying to understand and one thing that, that, that really threw me off um, before this screen is why does, why do live streams get so many dislikes before they even start? So I checked about an hour before we started, uh, which was 5 p.m. here. And that was just before I posted on, on social media, on Twitter and, and Google+. And the stream had like 30% uh, downloads on there. I, why? You didn't even see the stream. Why would you download it? Uh, it's, it's one of those things about YouTube I'm, I'm never going to understand probably. <clears throat> um, yeah, no, no, no Core XY. <laughs> People keep asking about Core XY. It, it doesn't matter if it's Core XY or just the, the standard MakerBot style setup where you have uh, X stacked on top of your Y axis. It, it really doesn't matter. Okay. I'm pulling some sort of cable there. I don't want to lose the camera. Okay, rotating turntable to side one. So that's. That's done. And now it's turning the laser on. Can you hear that? And that is not, I, I don't think that is actually the, the, the laser um, spinning up or heating up or anything, but that is just the laser movement that's in there. So that's a, a regular um, line laser unit. That's just this part of the machine um, rotating into its, its neutral position. So you can sort of see the, the laser line moving across the bed right there. Um, what is a good easy printable replacement for the clothes pin springs? Um, actually something like a, a rigid belt rerouting thing. So, um, I know it's not elastic, I know it's not adjustable, but if you just have your, your belt and put it into like a, a curved path like that, um, restraining on top here and then like put a push pin on the bottom and that should tension up your belt. Um, belts are, are sort of elastic too. Okay, 
Uh, missed peel on the AIO logo on front. Yes, it probably is. Um, the, that front thing there didn't come over there. That front transport, where is it? Some, somewhere around there. Um, that didn't come out or come off too cleanly. Don't put springs on belts. Yes, please do not. Belts should always be tensioned in a rigid fashion. Okay. One of these days I'm going to knock over a, a, a monitor or a camera or, or something. Calibration succeeded. Um, finally. Okay. So we want to scan. Now we should be able to scan. Okay, so we are on four inch height. Let's just verify that this is the, or 4.2 inch. Um, let's just verify that this is the correct height. Yes, you can see that the green um, cylinder actually goes all the way up to the, to the top of uh, this little figurine. Is that sort of legible, visible? I know there's a big softbox just reflecting into that. Okay, that should be good. Um, scan radius four inches, that's not... Come on. Come, I just wanted to go smaller. One more maybe. Okay, so that's the minimum, that's 1.25 inches, which is uh, probably like 3.7 centimeters. And that looks like it's, you know, completely encasing this, this figurine. Let's go scan this thing. That's bothering me. Hmm. Okay, so are we going to get a view from the camera inside? doing something. Lights are off. So I'm guessing what the what the um, door switch is actually for is if it detects that there is too much ambient light uh, falling into the machine it's actually gonna you know check is the door closed and then tell you hey okay close this thing down please to get better scan results. Um, that's something I've seen as an issue on another uh, line laser machine where you have just you know show floor lighting and just too much ambient light pumping into the machine and ruining your print. So what you're seeing on screen on the on the touch screen right there is I don't want to touch it um, is a, a view of what the scanner has already scanned and essentially it's just looking for that contrast between where the green laser um, I forgot the calibration paper I guess you can leave it in there um, so what was I going to say? So it's basically just looking for the contrast of that green laser in there, which you know you can see on this camera as well. You see the laser line. You see how far it's offset from you know where where a perfect cylinder or a perfect line would be, and yeah, it just looks for for that optical contrast. And if it doesn't get that because there is too much ambient light, so it drowns out that that green laser. Um, it just doesn't. Didn't peel off on the left side, not see it's a little bit here. Um, yeah. So if it doesn't see that contrast, the scans is still gonna finish if the software is not really you know looking for that sort of issue. But ideally, um, you're gonna get better results if you have the door closed, obviously. But then you guys aren't gonna see the scan happening. So yeah. Real-time scan result up there. Yes, can we can we rotate that? That would be sweet. I don't think we can. No, unfortunately not. Um, but it is looking like it's isolating the model from the calibration paper background pretty well. There are a few, you know, things you can see down here um, where it picks up contrast from the um, from the pattern. But in general, it's sort of it's sort of just picking up the uh, the figurine. So that's. So far, you know, for first scan side, obviously, um, pretty good, pretty good. Mm. 
The next one who types Prusa has to buy a Mac too for everyone in chat. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so Mani David um, asking about Philoween. Yes, the Mark IIs. So there's one over there in a box. And there's one behind me right there. Both of these are basically running 24-7 for Philoween prints. Um, I'm doing like a bunch of... There's actually a, a few on here right now. Um, I'm doing tons and tons of comparisons. Uh, so... Like the the one thing I'm just trying to figure out right now is, is actually how good are these tests. And so far, I mean, the print quality is relatively... Or is, is pretty reliable and it's very consistent between prints. But I'm just trying to figure out right now how good is the, the repeatability of the strength test. Um, and, you know, this is like the fourth set or so of just the, the, the same test parts from the same PLA. Just, you know, science. Calculate a standard deviation. Do math. Um, Anad Crystal is asking, hey, did I ask for tips yet? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I guess I can ask for tips. You guys can get a live shout out on, on screen. Uh, whoa, how do cameras work? Right over there um, in the in the center of the screen. If you want to like send a tip, send a send a, a case of beer or something or a cappuccino or an espresso uh, my way, feel free to do that. The, the link is in the video description. Um, but I, I, I really don't like bothering you guys for, for, for tips and cash and stuff. It's like, be here, enjoy the stream. Um, you know, this is content for you guys, so. Yeah. Right. Uh, what was it going to go on about? So right now the machine is going on by itself. So uh, I can barely make that out. It's 12 minutes, I think, right? 11.38. Okay. That's going to be a while. So. Actually, I'm going to look at chat and I'm, I'm going to look confused uh, so Aaron York is, uh, is saying for the Prusa i3 Mark II the kit version lacks a Y motor brace the pre-built version comes with it let's double check that so the the, the, the Y motor so that's on the back of the Y motor okay so this is the pre-built one it has the brace and the kit version does not that's an interesting point that is an interesting point. Let's see how that is, is actually fixed. To the motor, it is not. It's just... Mm, okay. Mm. Thanks everyone for pointing that out. That might be a, a quick little upgrade um, you can do to your Mark IIs. So that's confirmed. Um, yep, that's right. Um, so two more things while that thing scans. Um, I'm going to look for, for the software, for the ARO software in a second. A um, few more questions on following. Did I print a 910 alloy yet? I did not print it yet. I've got it here. I'm going to put it... I'm going to put... Reading chat, you can print out. I'm going to print 910 in, in you know, a few days. Um, I've got a bunch of nylons and a bunch of stuff from Tom and that should be pretty awesome performance-wise. Um, yeah, and what else? Any reason for CF filament? Yeah, I, I did have two CF filaments in there already. I did have the Protopasta HTPLA CF and the 3D Prima PTG CF, both of which, you know, had, a, had an interesting surface finish but didn't offer any increase in strength. In fact, they were both less strong than uh, the, uh, the traditional non-filled materials. Looking pretty good, but yeah, in, in general, I'm I'm more excited about on on your standard printer. I'm I'm more excited about you know the the non-filled standard materials that it can easily print and get like really precise prints. That's that's the one thing I'm always looking for, and that's the one thing I'm always tuning for, and get strong prints because I'm I'm working on on a video on detailing um, the, that entire ABS thing, but ABS if you don't print it like super hot or in a heated chamber, you are going to get bad layer adhesion. It's just, it's a matter of fact. And most printers just don't have, you know, an enclosed build chamber or a heated one. And even if you print this particular ABS that I'm printing with um, in an enclosed chamber, it's not going to be as strong as PLA. So that's something that um, 
and that I'm going to have to, you know, investigate and, and uh, really look into. By the way, thanks for the tip from uh, Rob Andrews. Thanks for convincing me to order an original Pusha IV Mark II. You're not going to regret it. People are posting like, hey, this was an expensive video for me. I just bought a Mark II. I'm like, yeah, good choice. Good choice. Well, well invested money. Right, I'm going to look for the software for the AIO um, Zeus. And I'm actually going to give you guys a view of that and also enable that camera right there. That is upside down. Great. Premiere tutorial download. The scan is still scanning the full width of the thing. Yeah, that might just be the standard um, scan cycle that it's doing, but um, what the software is probably doing is that it's ignoring everything that is outside of that circle and, you know, keeping artifacts down that way. Software slicer, Zeus Slick 3 r calibration file for off-board slicing and the Slick 3 r software. Okay, so what the Zeus also does, because it's like a full uh, Linux computer in there, is marketing package. Don't need that. So apparently, we we, we don't even we don't even need uh, any software downloads. That is that is, I appreciate that. So what the Zeus does apparently is because this is a Linux computer. This is a full on, you know, Raspberry Pi style sort of machine in here. Is it doesn't require you to slice your STLs before you print. You just give the printer the STL and it slices it for you. Um, that is, well, <laughs> that, it's interesting at the very least. Um, I do appreciate them trying to, I don't want to press anything, you know, go out and go outside of the scan window because it might stop it. Um, I do appreciate that because, you know, slicing and that extra step for going from an STL to, um, to a G code file, that's always sort of bothering unnecessary because typically you know for me I'm, I'm just going to change one or two things at most in the slice and use all the same settings for most prints um, but um, the the question is going to be how much of that can you actually tune inside the the slicer that's uh, installed on the Zeus and how how that's going to compare to an, an off-board slick through a slice Update release notes? Update release notes? Wait, Aaron, is that is that referring to Wait, is that referring to the Zeus update? Also huge thanks to Arnaud Crystal um Thirty-year donation for a wireless keyboard that might be really useful for the live streams. Uh, yeah, that's that might be something I'm going to get for that in thirty years. Should give me a, a relatively decent one. I don't want to say I want to get a unifying one because I'm I'm sort of torn on Logitech, but that should be pretty good. If, if you look at the the one I'm using here, which is just a, a cheap Arctic one that I got for like five bucks, I've actually got the all the the hotkeys for OBS Studio written on there with some marker. I don't really want to do that to a nice wireless keyboard, but still. Ah, thanks for that. Really appreciate it. Um, so while I was viewing the website, Aaron wanted to see what the... I still have screen cap on F5. I don't know why I didn't change that yet. Wanted to see if there were any... Um, <laughs> any update notes. Let's see. Frequently tutorials. So the update happens inside the machine itself and it already showed me an update. Oh, the scan is here. Is the scan done? It already showed me an update notification, but I skipped that because I don't really want to um I, I don't really want to to like 
do that update and risk breaking stuff for having it take 20, 30, 40 minutes or something. Um, yeah, didn't want to risk that. Why did I click that? Update, update release notes, there we go. A bunch of version numbers right there. So adding G, I don't know what the, what the version is on this machine particularly. Um, but this newest one, start the general tips app. Okay, that would have been useful. Camera intrinsic calibration file from USB. You can do that, sure. Changes video, okay. So yeah, it looks like about every two weeks or so they're pushing out a new update. Um, most of these things seem to be related to 3D scanning. Because that, admittedly, that is a huge part of, of this machine. You, the reason why you buy this thing is because it has the, three, the 3D scanner built in. You, if, you, if you want to spend two and a half thousand dollars, or it's, it's around 3,000 euros actually, if you look on, on the uh, German Amazon um, page, that is a lot of money for a 3D printer. And there are certainly other options out there that you can go for instead and get maybe a bigger build volume, maybe something that's enclosed, maybe something that's... Well, I guess the, the, the uh, Linux system in there is a pretty nice feature. Um, you're not going to find that on many machines. But yeah, like, like I'm saying, that there are a lot of op other options at $2,500 of total price plus tax, of course. So the scanner is really the, the unique selling point. So it, it's understandable that they're investing a lot of time and resources into getting that right. So what it's doing right now is um, it's, you know, typically the way the, uh, the laser line scanners work is they take your part. Let me just switch it over to the, to the cam. There we go. Nope, that's the webcam. Holy crap. So it typically takes your, your 3D model, it rotates it continuously and always has the laser line fixed on like the center line of your part. So I think we sh can, can we grab this one out? I don't know. Let's just grab the, the Xbox controller. So it, it keeps your laser line dead center on the part and it then just rotates the part and uses that as like a continuous line recording of that, uh, of that scan. What this one is doing instead is it's creating four independent Scan. So it's taking, you know, let's say you aligned this to the front. It's taking the scan from this side. It's got the, the camera off. So like if, if you are the, um, you're the, the scanner camera, it's actually got a laser that's coming from a bit from off the side. So as the scanning, op op well, as the, the scanning object rotates, it's going to see how, how much that laser line is offset. So it's going to take this part right there. It's going to, you know, swipe the laser across from that offset position, then it's going to rotate the part where that's what it did. Actually, it's going to rotate the part. It's going to take another scan, another swipe, rotate it again, and then, you know, combine those four scans into a single one. And that's what it's doing right now. Um, you can do a similar process, sort of, um, if you have one of those, those traditional laser scanners, if you like move the parts to a different position to get different angles on, um, yeah, on the same scan part to catch more detail. But yeah, they, this one is, is doing that right inside the machine and in an automated way, which I do appreciate. Octoprint can run Cura, yes. Um, a photogrammetry based scanner. So this is, I don't think this is called photogrammetry. Photogrammetry is what 123D Catch uses to use basically a regular camera with no laser reference hints or anything and just takes the perspective of, of your different scans and, and combines that into an image. Chad, if you know a software that does that in an offline way that does photogrammetry on your actual computer and doesn't require you to upload that to... Um, what are they called? Uh, one, two, three D, whatever they're called. Um, upload it to, to some sort of a, a cloud service and have them process it for you. If you know any sort of free service that does that on your local machine, because I have plenty of computing power. I want to do that locally and tweak with that uh, locally. If you have a tip for, for software like that, let me know.
LG Soft, Agi Soft. LG Soft. I'm gonna have to look into that. Is that like a it's kind of finished? Ooh, sweet. I'm gonna look through the chat recordings and uh, when when we're done, keep keep posting. So scan is not done. Yeah, that wireless keyboard is gonna come in real handy. <laughs> so I'm guessing I can I can sort of rotate this around already. Okay. I'm gonna make sure block the the softbox from the screen here. It might block the camera as well. But there's a sort of, well, okay, so this is sort of like the same thing you're getting as if you're using um, like a laser line scanner. You're getting the point cloud. This Again, this is not a multi-touch monitor. You're getting a point cloud and what it's doing right now, it's, it's, it's converting this point cloud, which is just a, a bunch of individual points on the surface. It's converting that into a mesh, which is a closed, um, you know, watertight, ideally. Um, a, a watertight surface that then the, the slicer can use to uh, create a 3D printed to, to create the, the commands for your 3D printer. Right now it's still just a bunch of individual points on the surface and right now it's, it's connecting those together. Visual SFN and Agishoft Photoscan. I'm just going to copy paste those. Notepad. Converting point cloud to STL, it's converting the point cloud to a to a mesh surface. Not necessarily an STL yet, but that's the an STL is is a mesh essentially. Autodesk, that's what they're called. Autodesk remake can do it locally if you have an NVIDIA card. I do. Have to try that out. Autodesk sort of, you know, has an has an interesting approach um, when it comes to their their licensing and their software right now. I'm hoping you don't need the P100. <laughs> so, uh, when it comes to licensing and you know giving giving a lot of their stuff out for for like free and for makers to use, but then also providing like add-on licenses and and, and models uh, for a more professional user base. Autodesk Remake requires 16 gigs of RAM. Well, that's not a problem. I do edit 4K video, which probably, you know, I got 64 gigs of RAM, so <clears throat> yeah, don't really care there. So Connects for 3D scanning, um, I actually haven't tried that yet, but the Connects, especially the, the newer Connect, what's it called? Connect 2 or Connect um, V2, the, the, the one from the, um, yeah, from the new Xbox, essentially. That one supposedly has a, a relatively good scan done now? Relatively good reproduction of, of like larger models. Um, just like the, um, the original one, which needed reading glasses, but you know, just interesting. Um, <laughs> Ooh, I'm hoping that's only the preview because that looks really bad. That must be only the preview. So the, the Kinect gives you pretty good results if you have a, something that's a bit larger. Do you have to save this? Dot .aio, okay, so I, we're gonna have to see if we can export this as a standard uh, STL. Um, yeah, Kinect pretty good for, for large stuff. If you need smaller stuff, um, you are gonna have to put some reading glasses on it, but from what I've seen and from what I've talked to people about, um, it is it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Done. Okay. So let's see if we can print this thing. STL. Okay, so there are a few sample prints on here. A I O. And there's the scan files. Okay, so that's a, what is this? So that's something that they included out of the box. That's a cat. That is a relatively creepy rendition of a cat. Yeah, 
I mean, I, I can't really tell what it can. Can we see the ah? There is the STL. Yes. Yes. Go away. Okay, so that is a CAT scan. Um, I don't think I want to print it. So that there are a few artifacts here around the the paw. Where is the back button? There you go. There's our scanned angel, angel, angel. It looks like there is a bit of a, so the ply is the, uh, is the point cloud, STL is the, the finished. Yes. And no to close that. Well, that's still not centered. It looks like there's a bit of detail missing around the shoulder there. And well, I can try to zoom in. And there's this, <laughs> wow, there are these strange things growing out of its forehead and um, cheek. Let's see the back here. So yeah, the, the, these are probably stitching artifacts where just the, the individual um, the individual scans were st stitched together. So far we, we're getting relatively good detail. Let's just print this. Let's just try out the let's just try the the slicer uh, that's included so Zeus DVT I think that's the one that we want we're gonna do a quick print we're gonna do a 10 because five percent I'm not really comfortable with that we're not gonna use a brim we're not gonna use a raft we're not gonna use supports let's see okay very simple very, very simple interface. Layers, layer height, perimeter, shells, top solid layers, bottom solid layers, fill density. So they, these are all the, the important settings that I want to see. I honestly don't care about the rest that much. Speeds, I'm not going to mess with that. Misc, brim, okay, that's cool. Vase mode is included. Supports included. And that's it. You can set the print temperature. But other than that, you know, it, you're very, very limited. These are... To me, these are the, the most important settings, and you know, good to see that they've they've you know dumbed it down enough where it's still usable, but doesn't overwhelm me with all those different settings. Preparing for slicing, um, yeah. So, do we actually have to do anything here before it starts slicing? So, I guess I'm guessing this is a, a real time slicing setup. I don't know if I actually threw it off by just. Um, going into the settings before it finished slicing. Let's try that again and go with the defaults. Don't even go into settings and the next button doesn't work it. It's still preparing for slicing. So that's going to be a while, I guess. Remove the stuff from the print bed. Um, yeah, in a second. Make a tutorial about Kinect, please. Uh, I don't have a Kinect. I would have to purchase one. I'm not that into 3D scanning yet, so I uh, don't think I'm, I'm going to be buying a Kinect anytime soon. Right, preparing for slicing. Um, <laughs> let's see if that thing slices actually. And I'm gonna leave you guys for a second. Keep a keep an eye out for this machine and if it does anything.
Are we there yet? Wow, that didn't do anything yet. <laughs> Let us quickly grab the a USB battery for the uh, for the road link here because I just was running out of battery pretty quickly and it didn't want to get cut off. Let's see how this is doing. Oh, RX is still on the OK side. So we should be good for the rest of the stream. Right. Preparing for slicing. It looks like it looks like we might be overwhelming the onboard slicer with this with this model right there. So instead, let's try something else. Let's try and okay, so we, we're getting the USB, no USB connected, obviously. Um, let's try and actually get this scan off of the machine and uh, transfer it to a USB. I should have brought one. Transfer it to a USB thumb drive. I can, oh wait, I, I do have one. Because Lulzbot were kind enough to include one with the uh, with the Lulzbot Mini. Let's see if we can actually figure out how to get the to get the previous scan off of the off of the machine. Let's just plug in the, the USB thumb drive. That should work. That should do something. Zeus apps are come. I guess that's missing a soon, so it's coming soon. So scan, that's that. I don't think we can actually move this off of the machine somehow. That's all we're getting. Well, let's ask our dear documentation. Screen cap, yay. Download, so the interesting thing is gonna be how, uh, let's switch cameras. Uh, the interesting thing is going to be how this machine integrates its Wi-Fi and networking functionality into, um, you know, your, your regular workflow. If you're going to be able to, I think the cameras can't right now, sorry. Uh, how are you going to be able to integrate that into your workflow? If you're going to be able to just send, um, you know, your, your G-code files or your STL files over to the printer through some sort of, of you know, network drive or something and do it like that and or, or if you have to use their proprietary software because right now it looks like you're, you're getting slick well, which is open source obviously you're getting a, a slick configuration file and that is it micro sd is there is there a micro sd slot in here somewhere no so the the Wi-Fi doesn't seem to do all that much. 